Amen. We love babies so much that everyone in our church has a lot of babies. Amen. We have so much that we have to give away. If you want a baby, we're going to give them away today. Hey, we're glad you're here today. Come on, give God a bigger hand clap because you are here this morning. All right. You ready to start? Get your outline, and we're going to start. Let me pray, and you'll follow me with your outline. Today, we conclude our series, Building for the Future. All right? Now, how many of you have been here the five weeks? How many of you have been here the five weeks? All right? Give yourself a round of applause. All right? Now, if this is your first time here, uh, if you want to give, that's up to you. We don't want you to feel obligated. We are giving because we're giving for the future of our family and for the future of our church. All right? So let me pray, and then uh, I'm just going to do a recap quickly of the last five, uh, four weeks, and we'll get started, and we'll conclude our series today, uh, Building for the Future. Father, thank you because you're so awesome. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on cross for us. And next week, we will be celebrating that Jesus rose from the dead. Thank you, God, because you have a plan for each and every one of our lives, and as we've been going through this series You have a brighter future for each and every one of our lives and our families and ultimately our church. Continue to help us as we live for you. And if there's anyone here today that does not know you, I pray that they will leave understanding that you love them and you have a purpose for their life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. All right. So uh, every year we do a series. It's called Building for the Future. And... um, uh, These are the topics that we've discussed the past five weeks. All right. So week one, we talked about it all starts here. And we talked about that if we are going to handle and uh, manage our money better, we had to realize that God owns everything. And you and I are just God's money manager. Say with me, God owns all. I'm just his money manager. So we started off saying that if we're going to improve the way we uh, uh, manage our money, we had to start there. Put God first. God owns everything. And then week two, I taught you about how to handle with care everything God has given to you. Look, God has blessed each and every one of you here. Even if you don't feel blessed, just the fact that you have life, that's a blessing. All right, so irregardless, most of us, we don't know what to do with what we get from God. And if God is going to bless you more, you have to learn to handle with care everything that God gives you. All right, so that's what we talked about in week three. Week three was slowly but surely, and we talked how God is able to help us get out of debt. How many of you know God is going to help you and God wants to help you to get out of debt? All right. Last week, my wife talked about money smart. How many of you are smart? How many of you are smart? You feel like. How many of you are smart with your money? All right. How many of you are smart, but you've done some bad, some dumb mistakes with your money? All right. So last week, My wife taught on how to save money, all right? So if this is your first week, today I'm going to teach you how giving is living, all right? So in your outline, let's read the uh, the introduction with me. Uh, All of you read with me. It says this. When we begin the series, we establish the truth that God owns everything and that we are his money managers. He is a generous, giving God and as children of God, We must experience in our own life that giving is living. We live to give. We are blessed. Come on, say it like you believe it. We are blessed to be a blessing. All right? So the thing that we teach here at church is that we want you to experience in your own life what it is that God blesses you for you to be a blessing. So during these weeks, uh, these five weeks, not only did we teach this, but in the life groups we go over it, we had a seminar. We had a financial seminar, and we uh, uh, encouraged you to buy a book, Managing God's Money. And last week, we asked you to fill out these questions. How has this series helped you? 
And did you attend the financial seminar? Yes or no? And did you, rec- uh, did you buy the book we recommended you? So someone came to the financial seminar, and this is what this person wrote. The presentation and the worksheets of the seminar or, or the sessions was empowering and encouraging. There was no judgmental, there was no judgmental or degrading. I used the spending application on my phone. So this person is simply saying that by coming to the seminar, it empowered her or him, and it encouraged them, and uh, that was the purpose of the seminar. All right? Now, this other one wrote this. How has this series helped you? This person wrote, it has been wonderful for me and my family We took the leap of faith and started tithing, believing for something amazing. We don't know how, but $2,000 was in our bank account unexpectedly. I went to my bank account to make sure it wasn't in my account. It was a long process that we we should have waited for over a year, but the thing we resolved... And they gave us back $2,000 from something that was resolved. So there's other testimony. If you have a testimony. Because at New Life, we want you to experience for yourself God's blessing. Because it's not what I have experienced that will make the difference in your life. It's what you experience that's going to mark your life. And it's going to make the difference that builds conviction that God not only blesses us, but we we are blessed. To be a blessing, we live to give. Yes, All right? You're either a taker or a giver. You're a taker because you're not saying nothing. <laughs> Say with me, God, make me a giver. Yes. All right? But don't be an Indian giver. All right? So let's go. Number one, giving is living. God blesses generous people. Y'all don't seem convinced. God blesses generous people. Let me say it again for those that are on the balcony. God blesses generous people. The Bible says in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. All right? At the end of the service, at the end of the service, we're going to give you a book. For every family, we're going to give one book per family. So if you're here for the first time, make sure you get your book and then go to the guest center. We have another gift for you. Now, how many of you like to receive? I can tell. How many of you like to give? I can also tell. (laughs) Now, the Bible says, this is what the Bible says. Jesus said it. Paul said this. Jesus said it. And Luke wrote it. It is more blessed to give than to receive. All right? One day, there were some kids at school that were playing around in the playground. And, you know, one of the other kids was bigger, and he was bullying on the other one. And the other one, you know, it had been going on for several weeks, several weeks. And one day, the younger kid, he just, I don't know if he was Manny Pacquiao. I don't know if he was Floyd Mayweather. I'm not promoting their fight because they're not going to give me nothing. But the little kid just simply went like this, and he went, what? He smacked the other kid, knocked him out cold. They took him to the office, and the principal, he didn't even investigate who started it, how did it happen. The principal saw how that kid got, he he said, excuse me, son, where did you learn how to hit like that? Why? And, And the principal asked, why did you hit the other kid? And the little kid goes, My dad has always taught me that it is more blessed to give than to receive. (laughs) And the principal said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you just say? He says, my dad has taught me that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So the principal said, is your dad a pastor? Go, no. He's a boxer. (laughs) And when you give, you become like your father God, and you knock out the devil from your finances. Because it is more blessed to give 
than to receive. The Bible says that God blesses generous people. Proverbs 11.25 says, Be generous and you will prosper, be prosperous. Help others and you will be helped. All right? So the Bible says that for us to be generous and you will be prosperous. Help others and you yourself will be blessed. Say with me, God blesses generous people. people. Point number two, God provides a pathway for generous people. Somehow, some way in your life, in your marriage, in your career, in your finances, all around, all around you, God will open up pathways for you. Let me repeat that again. God will open doors. God will make a way where there seems to be where there seems to be no way. All right? Now, in your outline, I explained to you right there four things that I believe that biblical generosity is. Biblical generosity, first of all, gives God the first and the best. Let me tell you why biblical uh, generosity gives God the first and the best. Let me tell you this. God never gives out of what is left over. Have you ever been eating and you left something and someone comes and you're not hungry in the morning. Say, would you like some? <laughs> what would you do if instead of you start eating, you would offer someone else what you're about to eat? When God gave his son Jesus, he did not send an archangel. He did not send a seraphim. He did not send an angel. God gave the best that he had in heaven to die for you and for me. And as children of God, we do not give God the leftovers. We give God the first and we give God the best because we are children of God. So biblical generosity is giving God the first and giving God the best. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 verse 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. In other words, put God first of all your crops and then... Your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. In other words, God will give you more than what you have given to him. And then the Bible says biblical generosity is giving regularly and systematically. All right? Being consistent. And the Bible says this, on, the, on every Lord's Day. When is the Lord's Day? Every Sunday. On the Lord's Day, each of you should put aside something for what you have earned during the week. And use this for the offering. Use it for this offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. All right? Now, I've been a Christian for 33 years. And truly, just the fact that God delivered me from drugs and God delivered me from poverty and God took me out where I was never able to get out of, my, out of that area... I am a blessed person simply the fact that I receive salvation and the forgiveness of my sins. All right? I'm just saying that. All right? So for the past 33 years, I've been serving God. All right? I'm not a pastor because I I come from a lineage of pastors. I'm simply a pastor because God decided to save me and God from my mother's womb had a purpose for my life. Now, you know that I like to travel. Y'all know that, right? See? Okay, and one day, let me tell you this story. One day, the $100 bill and the $50 bill were were talking to the $1 bill. And the $100 bill and the $50 bill talking to the $1 bill says, man, where do you travel all over the world? And the $50 bill responded and said, man, I... The $50 bill said, man, I go to Cancun every week. I'm in Las Vegas. I'm in New York. The $100 bill said, man, I don't get out of Dubai. And and they asked the dollar bill, where where have you traveled? He said, man, I never get out of church. Because sadly, God saved me 33 years ago. And when I travel, I spend $1,500. And sometimes we still are giving $1. Don't say ouch. Don't say man. But I can say you're a, t- you're a taker. Because if you were a giver, so no, no, that's not me. And see, and when God blesses you, you give to God on the first day of the week, regularly and systematically, because God blesses generous people. And when God blesses you, God provides a pathway for generous people. 
Can I get any witness? Can I get any amens that God has opened doors for you? And then in your outline, biblical generosity is, read it, biblical generosity is what? And not forced upon you. All right? The Bible says this. So I thought it necessary to urge you brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gifts that you have promised. Paul is writing the Corinthians. The church in Jerusalem have been going through a famine. They've been going through a lot of uh, 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 financial and a lot of need. So Paul wrote the churches in Asia Minor. And he says, you know what? The church in Jerusalem gave us the gospel. They blessed us by sending missionaries. Now they are in need. They're not in need of the gospel. They are in need of finances. They are in need of food. So I want all you churches to help me to bless the brothers because you are blessed to be a? You are blessed to be a? So the churches in Macedonia were the first to give. And the church in Corinthians had promised an offering for the church in Jerusalem. So that's the reason Paul is writing. So he says, hey, it is necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift that you had promised. A year before, the church in Corinth moved or encouraged by the church in Macedonia and said, you know what? We're going to give also. So a year had gone by and Paul says, make sure it's ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. And then he goes on to say, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion or under obligation, for God loves a hilarious giver. Yes, amen. You know what hilarious is? When I tell you a joke and you begin to laugh. This word cheerful is that when you give to God, you must give not... Look, in any time in our church, this is the truth. Yesterday, we had uh, discipleship classes. And in my discipleship class, I asked, well, how long have you been coming to New Life? Uh, why are you coming? And one of the persons says, you know what? It, it could have been me, he says, but I visited a lot of churches. And for years, I thought they all they wanted was my money. And here I have learned that they want God's blessings over me more than my money. It's, it could have been me, but I realize that when we give here, it's really going to what y'all say it's going for. Yeah. Now, listen to this. In the month of November, I'm going to Africa. I'm going to Nigeria. And if you want to come with me, you can come to Nigeria. The, when, when I've been to Nigeria once. And when they pick up their offering, it's the most exciting moment of their service. They make two lines. They make a line on, my, on one side, all the women get on one side, and all the men get on one, their side. They get their offering, and all of them dance. It's not John Travolta. <laughs> all right? But when they're bringing their offering, all the women, all the children, all the men, they're dancing. They're coming to bring their offering to God with cheerfulness, with thanksgiving, because they're, eight, and my God, I mean, I've seen them, and they... They, so if you want to, because some of us, no, the Bible says you should never give reluctantly or under obligation. If any time you feel pressure to give at this church, we don't want you to give. And we will pressure no one because God wants your offering voluntarily. It has to come out of your heart before it comes out of your pocket. You hear what I said? It has to come out of your heart before it comes out of your pocket. And when you give it, you make sure my, you put a smile in your face. You sing. If you don't know how to sing, just say whistle. All right? But the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. All right? And then biblical generosity is sowing generously. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9... Verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And then the Bible says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now, this is what it means. What you and I give is a seed. Say with me, it's a seed. If I was to have an apple in my hand right now, if I was to have an apple in my hand, 
or an orange, there are seeds inside that apple, and there are seeds. In, I'm going to stick with the apple. Forget it, the orange. There are seeds in, the, in, in, in that apple. That one seed can produce a tree. And that tree is not going to produce one apple. It's going to produce a lot of apples. And if you get all those apples again and get all those seeds, you're not going to have two trees. You're going to have many trees and many more apples. So what God is trying to tell us, because God is a sower and God is a reaper, God sold one son, and because of that one son, everyone that's going to make it to heaven from Africa, from India, from Mexico, from Galveston, is because of that one seed, that one son that God sold, and because God sold his son, he reaped of harvest of many more sons and children. That's how God works, all right? So the Bible says, make sure you understand this. Make sure you understand this. If you sow little, sparingly, you reap little. But if you sow generously, you reap generously. Now, he supplies the seed to the sower. Now, this is the truth. Whatever you give and whatever you're going to give in the future, God gives it to you even before you give it. If you learn to be a sower, God will bring the seed into your hands. Because Paul says it is God that supplies the seed to the sower. What I am going to give today, it was God that brought the seed into my hands. And not only will he give me the seed to sow, but God will provide bread for me and supply. And not only will he give me my daily bread, but God will increase the store of your seed. You know what that means? God will bless my savings, my seed, and as I continue to give, God will not only give me bread. Listen to this. God provides for me, but when he blesses me, it's so that I can bless others. And if you learn to be a sower, God will bring seed into your hands. Now, this is the power of of sowing. It's in your outline. Your responsibility is to sow. It is God's responsibility to give you the increase. All right? And you only reap what you And you reap after you sow. And you always reap much more than you sow. Okay? So you always reap much more than you sow. So when you are generous to God... God not only blesses generous people, but God provides a pathway for generous people. And finally, number three, generosity begins with a step of faith. Generosity begins with a step of faith. The Bible says, by faith. Say with me, by faith. faith. Come on, shout it out, by faith. faith. Say it again, by faith. Abel brought God, what? A better offering than Cain did. And by faith, he was commended, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. You know that Abel is dead and we still speak about Abel? You know that you can go on to the next life and you're a generous life. People will talk about you. And you can be greedy and people will talk about you too. So you decide what you want to say about you. Man, he was greedy. Or they want to say, man, that person was generous because he learned to give, to live, or he lived to give. All right? So when you give, not only must you give with a cheerful heart, but you must learn to give to God in faith. Now, it doesn't work like this. Please listen to what I'm about to tell you. My amount that I'm going to give today, I'm not giving doing this. God, I expect a million dollars in return. It doesn't work like that. Because many times God will return to me, not necessarily finances, but God will bless me in giving my kids open doors for their university. (laughs) Caleb Caleb already got a scholarship, $3,000 a semester. That's $3,000 that I have to pay. Listen. 
Caleb hasn't even arrived in California, but Dr. Ellis already called, and Caleb already has got a job waiting for him in California. That means more money in my pocket, more money in his pocket. All right? So not necessarily does God give me money, but God opened doors for my kids. All right? My air conditioning is 10 years old. Mine is one of those heat units that goes up in the and it cost me to replace it gonna cost me between five, six thousand dollars. So about a month ago, I called my AC guy and he said, Pastor, he knows me, he said, Pastor, you need to replace that. I said, I know it. And he goes, I went to a Baptist church on university, brand new unit. The pastor gave it to me. He said, Pastor, if you pray, if you I'm praying, I said, I'm praying. If you pray the crane, if you pay the crane, the crane costs us $250. You don't have to pay me anything. I will give you that new unit, and you'll replace your old, and you will have a new AC. Now, what do you think I prefer? Do you think I prefer to pay $5,000, or do you think I prefer to pay $250? So I've been after that. Hey, guy, hey, when you going to come please move the AC? Because it's about to get hot in this summer. So not necessarily... That God will return to me a million dollars. But many other ways, God will make a pathway. God will open doors that you never thought God could open. But you have to do it. You have to do it in faith. You have to do it in faith. Believe in it. God will receive. And now, this is the power about sowing. I don't have the power to make the seed germinate. I don't have the power to make the seed grow. But God has the power not only to make it rain, but God has the power to make that grow and to produce a harvest. Yes, yes. You know, we're about to build. We got to go through some procedures of God getting the permits and all that. So we, we're, this, if, you, if you've seen, they've already taken out the windows of that house. In two or three weeks, that house is going to be demolished. So I need some of you ladies. We don't want you to take your anger against your husband. Come and take your... No, no, no. We're going to hire a company. They're going to demolish that. All right? So uh, the city, the city council, uh, they asked me, do you know the neighbors on, on that side? I said, yeah, I know one of them is from Piedras Negras. The other one is from Salvador, Milton. <laughs> he live right there? And then the other, I know the other lady. I said, you need to talk to, to the person, the families that live on this side because they are the ones that are going to be more affected by that new building. So I said, okay. I got Milton. I'll go talk to the guy from Mexico. So I went to talk to the other, uh, the other lady that lives there. She's lived there 35 years. So on Friday... I went over there, knocked at the door, and Miss, that's her name, Miss Alice, came out. And she knows me, said, Pastor Gomez, how can I help you? I said, Miss Alice, as you can tell, we bought John's house. He said, yeah, he already told me. John's leaving. He says, and uh, we're about to build, possibly start in the fall, but by next year we hope to have it built. Do you have any questions or any objections? Or No, Pastor, of course not. And then she says this, Pastor, I've lived here 35 years, and you have very good people in your church. Because I have never seen a church buy so much property. And, he said, and, and then I said this, Miss Alice, we have very generous people at New Life. All right? Now, this is what she said about y'all. She said, no, you don't have generous people. You have wealthy people. That's what she said. I don't know if you believe it, but I, I'm going to believe it. All right? So let me conclude by sharing this other testimony. This is Max Benavides. Max Benavides is 11 years old. He's a fifth grader. He lives in Edinburgh, Texas, in the valley with his parents, Guadalupe and Marisol Benavides. His father is a high school science teacher. He teaches biology and chemistry. His mom is a doctor. His mom is Marisol. Uh, Marisol and, and Lupe are from the valley. They met. I don't know how they met. They got married, and they went to school in, in, in Brownsville or in McAllen. Both of them became teachers. And after several years of Marisol teaching at a public high school, 
she told her husband, I want to go back to school and I want to become a doctor. So she applied to several medical schools and she was accepted at UTMB Medical School. So back in 2001, 2002, Max parents came to Galveston because she came to study medicine here in Galveston. Max, his parents call him the miracle child. He's a fifth grader and his father tells me that in science, in math, in reading, he's either number one or number two of not only the school, but the whole school district. He's a gifted and talented child. He says that when he grows up, he wants to deliver babies. All right. His father teaches. His mom has been a doctor now for the past eight or ten years. Now let me go back to how they came to Galveston. They came to Galveston, and we still were meeting in the small church. And one day he walked by, and he stopped by. He's looking for his dad had just died. His dad lived in Portland, Oregon. His just his dad had died, and for years Lupe had gone away from church, had gone away from God. And after his dad died, he says, God, I want to go back to church. I want to take my family. Marisol did not, was not a Christian. And he started, he started, he started with his older kid, Lupito, Lupito, started attending church. Marisol was going, she was in, either in her first year or in her second year of medical school when she got pregnant with this baby boy. I don't know if it was in her second month, in her third month, she went for her regular checkup with her doctor. And that Friday, her doctor gave her the sad news. After doing a lot of studies, before she left, the doctor told her, Ma'am, I encourage you highly to abort this child. This child is going to be born with a lot of complications, and he might not even survive one day after he's born we didn't know anything about it for two days she was overwhelmed being a medical student herself she was going to be a doctor how to do you deal with this sad news that your child your doctor's telling you is better to abort him so friday saturday she was overwhelmed with this news she comes to church on a sunday she comes to church on a Sunday. And as we were praying for her, as we were praying for you, she says that my wife and I came to pray for her. And without us, without us not knowing anything that the doctor had told her on Friday, we prayed, we put our hands on her, on her belly, and she says, God says that this child is going to be born. We didn't even know. God says that this child is going to be born healthy. Don't, don't, don't you be afraid of anything. The miracle is on its way. Now, she had a decision to make. Do I do what the doctor says or do I believe what God just told me that he was going to do? Thank God she took a step of faith and now she has her miracle child. They were so grateful to God for their miracle child. And they believe in Zoe. They had two more children after him. <laughs> they had two more children. All right. So she had her child. 2004. Max was born. 2004. Okay. She finishes medical school. She, she was matched to stay here at UTMB. So they stayed here in Galveston. She was doing her residency. She was doing her two or three years residency. And in 2008, the summer of 2008, I noticed that their giving had gone down. So I sent them a courteous letter as someone that is interested in their well-being. And I just simply said, is there anything that the church or myself can help you with? Because I've noticed that your giving has gone down. I encourage you to put God first and honor. That's all I said. They got the letter. And this is what they say. When they receive the letter, the first thought that came through their mind is, who does pastor think he is? Does he think I'm getting paid as a doctor? Because when you're going to residency, you don't get paid a doctor's salary. You don't. And I knew that. I wasn't after it. And she said, does he think I'm getting paid as a doctor? That's the first thing they said. And then they were about to send me a letter 
saying, you know what? You don't get in our... And just when they were thinking that, God reminded them of the miracle of their baby. And God said, who did that miracle? How much would it have cost you to perform the miracle for your, chun, for your son to be born healthy? And immediately, they, they asked God for forgiveness. Listen to this. Two months before the hurricane, they started to put God first. They took a step of faith to begin to honor God. A month or two before the hurricane in 2008, she finishes her residency and she applies and UTNB hires her to be now to practice medicine here in Galveston. She signed her contract with UTMB in September of 2008. UTMB said, take a month off. In a month in October or November, you can start working. The hurricane hit. Those of you that are familiar know that UTMB let go of many doctors, and she was one of the persons that she was let go. Now, this is a miracle. She didn't work one day for UTMB. But UTMB, because she had written, she had signed her contract, she got paid a whole year's medical, a doctor's salary for one year, got all her insurance paid, and before this she had prayed to God because she had started four years and then she had done her residence. She had prayed, God, I wish I could rest a year. So when they went back to the valley, she was on vacation for a year, receiving a doctor's salary because she put God first and because they took a step of faith. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because they left our church. But they will never forget the experience that they had with God when they put God first in their life. And that's what we're after for you to experience for yourself that God truly blesses generous people and that God opens a pathway for generous people when you dare take a step of faith and honor God. You will never, ever, ever, ever outgive God. Come on, give God a big hand clap. Yes! So let me pray. Let me pray. Father, thank you, not only because of what Miss Alice said, that she has seen all these years how you have blessed our church and we've been able to do everything. I personally, God, thank you for knowing you as my Lord and Savior. God, you know that when I was lost, all my money went to drugs. But my money now, God, goes to build your kingdom and to build a better future for my kids. You know, God, that my wife and I don't make enough to pay for my kids' university. But you have provided for David. You have provided for Lily. And you will provide for Caleb in the name of Jesus. Father, not only have we experienced that as pastors, but like Lupe and Marisol, they experience it themselves. And that's the only thing I ask from you, God, that you will bless each and every one of the single moms, every couple, every young person, every children, that they will experience for themselves that you bless generous people. So today, God, as we are going to give our offerings to you for building for the future, I pray that you bless everyone that is going to give generously from the smallest amount to the largest amount as long as we give it to you in faith. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone said, yes, Lord. Amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap.